the uh, Aborigines and in New Zealand, the Maoris. Uh, they say that this is the closest thing the white man has done to the way they believe. And uh, so... Uh, yeah, yeah. And so uh, we're, we're now aiming our efforts at the quickest place we can do it and, and, and not giving up on the other situations. Like I've had one, see there's, you can take all of these principles and, and, and they're, the, they're new buildings. And we could build with an army of people and we're getting an army of people basically. Uh, we could put an army of people together building these buildings all over the world and we wouldn't scratch the surface of what uh, the number of existing buildings are. So taking these principles and applying them in what is called retrofit to uh, uh, existing buildings is a serious issue. And uh, we're, you know, it's not near as fun as going out in the boonies and starting from scratch and throwing up a carbon zero building. It's, takes, it's a lot more mental application to try to take an existing building and, uh, and retrofit it. It's expensive as well. Uh, but we're, we're doing it and attempting it. But what I'm getting at is we've got a project that's been on the books, on the drawing board and everything in uh, Long Beach, California. It's just a little half million dollar home that somebody bought and wants to turn it, add on to it and make it, uh, retrofit it to be more carbon, toward carbon zero. They can't get it absolutely carbon zero. And they're coming up against things like it is in a historic zone. And we can't even put thermal windows in it because you have to replace the windows with like kind of stuff, which is the old window weights and the old glass. I mean, it's like ridiculous. I mean, history is for history books, you know. Uh, otherwise, people are going to be history. And so it's like insane what's going on with retrofit. Uh, another, but retrofit is something like, it's something to have in your minds because everybody can't build a new house. Some people are going to need to retrofit their existing house. And it's taking everything, all the principles are simply the same. It's the procedure and, and of, of applying them to an existing building. A way, I, I was asked to go to Norway to teach a course, but at the same time, the School of Architecture in Norway, uh, it's, it's a, the Bergen School of Architecture, and they uh, are not part of a university, they're just an architectural school. And they bought a nine-story concrete bunker grain silo uh, that still smells of rotting corn and stuff. Uh, but the architecture students are in that building. It's, it is, you know, it's weatherproof. Where it rains on it and it doesn't leak very much. But it's just concrete, one-foot thick walls. And when I got there, it was in the winter, and the students are all in jumpsuits and hats and earmuffs and gloves, sitting at their drafting tables doing architecture freezing. And I didn't, you know, I, I pulled out my wool hat and gloves and everything just to be able to talk to them. And so they wanted me to help them figure out how to retrofit this building. And this, this really becomes a good approach to retrofit of cities. We, we had several discussions with all kinds of professors and designers and students and everything. And it was going to be super expensive to apply all of these principles, principles to this building. But it was a nine-story building, and it did have a huge volume of space. And the concept, and it's really, that's the issue, is coming up with a concept first. The concept that we ended up with to retrofit this building was it's such a massive thing that we, we, we called it, we determined that it was not a building. We called it terrain, just like cliffs and... and uh, rock formations and whatever. So we called it terrain and we, we quit trying to retrofit the building. We just went in and made little areas like swallows build little mud nests on the overhangs of uh, Super 8 motels and stuff like that. Uh, we would go in and apply all these principles to a little area. You know, this little area is warm, has a little solar panel, has a little water catchment, has plants growing, and we just go in like a little little cells of cancer almost and uh, overtake this building and, and rather than trying to retrofit the whole building we took our space and applied all these principles to it 
And so anyway, that's just another approach on retrofit because we're trying the more or less conventional approach to this house in Long Beach and it's like, it's been going on for almost a year, still don't have a permit. Uh, it's a shame, you know, that that's the way it is. But so retrofit is going to be facing the same thing that, uh, uh, that new buildings are to, it, it, you're, you're inhibited by the uh, nature of the situation. Uh, yeah. Uh, quick question. The last time we saw on the slides of the toxicity of the tire. How does how does your whatever you put over the tire prevent the toxicity? Of the well, uh, there's two answers to that question. There's another question that probably would come up, and I'll go ahead and bring it out: is burning of the tires too. But the the tire uh, when you go to a tire store. Uh, and it's got the show window and the sun coming through the window, you walk in and you smell the rubber. You know, it's off-gassing, they call it. Uh, so a lot of people ask that question, and, and we've gotten a lot of bad press on the website and stuff about, uh, you know, this is garbage. We even, actually, we went through a period of time where we had to determine every building as a waste dump. Uh, so get a permit for dumping waste. Uh, so... <laughs> Just paperwork. But uh, so a physicist from uh, University of Wisconsin on his own volition uh, did a big thick study on running air through tires, old tires, new tires, water, and so on. And he ended up with the thought that I think his last paragraph said that living in a tire building is as about as dangerous as eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And so then I would get people that said, well, if that peanut butter and jelly sandwich is on white bread, then it's dangerous. But the, so you get your sticklers for sure. But the, uh, the bottom line is he proved that he, what he came up with was that tires, after they got 20,000 miles on them, have done their off-gassing, okay. and they're not off-gassing anymore. But then, too, they are buried when you, when you uh, take a tire wall and we pack out this you'll probably be seeing or doing some of this today you pack out with cans and mud and cement and then you plaster you build that out to where it's tangent with the rest of the tire and then you plaster that so your minimum is about an inch and a half to two inches of plaster over one place but that grows to three four five eight ten so you you basically are, are burying the tire, that's a tire wall, it's buried. Even if it was off-gassing, it's sealed. But uh, they don't off-gas after they're old and they're buried. So that is, that is a, a non-issue, but we still get people uh, worried about that. I mean, we have, in the back of the Phoenix, when you go there, the tires are exposed. Uh, I mean, I don't think you'll smell anything back there. Uh, then uh, the other question that comes up a lot on tires uh, is uh, burning. You, everybody's heard about the tire piles around the world uh, spontaneously combusting, which they do. But that's because, like, a, if you take a crumpled up piece of newspaper with air all around it and everything, and you torch it with a cigarette lighter, it just goes up in flames. That's the way a tire pile is with all the tires with air all around them. Uh, they can spontaneously combust, and it's hard to put them out. But if you take paper, which is very combustible, in a New York City phone book and put a cigarette lighter to it, it doesn't, doesn't go off. It doesn't happen. That's the way a tire pounded with earth is. It's, uh, and, and that was my line, at least, that when people asked that question, that's what I told them. Well, that came true because uh, an earth ship up here in the mountains went through one of the major forest fires we've had in the last few years. And... Uh, the, uh, I've got pictures of it, the, the front face wood burnt off, the glass disintegrated, the roof disintegrated, everything went away except the tire walls. They were plastered and a couple of places, it wasn't a finished building, so a couple of places the tires weren't plastered over and that part the rubber melted down to the steel belted stuff. But wherever there was plaster on the tires, uh, the tire wall, they're actually going to build the building back on the same tire walls. So. Uh, they don't yeah, burn. Well, right? Yeah, I think so. They don't burn, and uh, 
as used as a wall and they don't off gas and they are indigenous to the entire planet and, and you can make uh, super walls out of them. And so uh, that's the general look at the, the basics. I think uh, we could take a 10 minute break and let everybody walk around and we'll get back into some system stuff. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to take a few questions, and people have been asking me questions, so I'm asking them to ask them again in front of everybody so that everybody gets the answer. But we're talking here briefly about uh, uh, the permitting in, in New Mexico, for instance. In New Mexico is where we developed this, so in New Mexico you pretty much can get a permit as quick as any other building. Uh, in Colorado, some state, some counties don't even require a permit. Some counties uh, are harder, and some are like New Mexico. Uh, we have, I have an architect's license still in Colorado. They haven't taken it yet, so uh, uh, that helps sometimes. But uh, the we had, uh, I mean, we had people. This is again many stories like this. We had people that were in one county in Colorado where the plan checker was, was new. She was engineer educated and she just made it really difficult for these people. And they had been working for two and a half years to get a permit and finally they couldn't wait any longer. And they went ahead and got a permit for, they just decided to buy a manufactured home that they bring in and set on concrete blocks and that they could live in while they continued to fight for their, product, for their uh, permit for the airship. And they did it, and they went in. Uh, the, only, the only stumbling block on their permit for the manufactured home was they had to sign an affidavit that said they would not let any infants or elderly people go in the building for six months because of the off-gassing of all the weird materials in it. And, but they got the permit. They got the permit in a couple of weeks where they'd been working on trying to get a permit for a carbon zero home for two and a half years. They ended up finally getting the permit, building the building, and getting a divorce. So, uh, so uh, somebody, you had a question. Your company, do they do the uh, uh, package plans like Shell and um, Power uh, for people? And yeah, we, we uh, go all over the world and we uh, do turnkey or what we call Shell and Systems. And there's a packaged plan book, but now when it, it, it's just simply out of date because what, when people choose something out of the package plan book, we try to move them into the new global application of that, which we don't have put into a package plan book yet, but it's still similar. And so, the, so a lot of people get us to do what we call shell and systems, and that's the structure. Uh, and the power, water, sewage systems installed. And sometimes no doors, uh, no floors, no ceilings. You, you, we define what you want us to leave out, and it keeps the price, you know, uh, cuts the price by 30, 35, even 40 percent. These buildings are labor intensive, so we keep these pies going. Usually it's like a uh, ballpark, it's like something like uh, 35 percent materials, 35 percent labor, and then, uh, what's that, 70, and then uh, you got subcontractors like your excavator, your electrician, and your plumber. They end up being in the neighborhood of 15% and uh, subs. And then uh, the rest of it is systems. You know, you, if, if, you're, if you're hiring a contractor like us to do it, there's profit. And then there's systems. But the thing to consider is that labor and materials are pretty close to the same. So if you're going to build the house, you're in, and they're in the neighborhood of 35%. So if you're going to build the building yourself or seriously participate in it, there's where you can cut. You can't really cut on materials. They cost what they cost. You can't cut on systems. They cost what they cost. If you know some subcontractors, maybe you can get a break. But if you're building or contracting the building yourself, you can cut profit out and greatly reduce labor uh, to the point where you can cut, you know, 
35% out of the building. Now then, if you, if you do that and do shelling systems, you can, you know, the, the $205 a square foot that I say these costs can probably be cut in half depending on your approach. I say $205 a square foot because some people, uh, it, it just shows you what these cost if you absolutely outright buy it. I've had these seminars going on for, I don't know, 15 years probably or more. And I had, I, in, the, in the first book, I said uh, uh, beavers and wasps can build their own homes and people can't. And I made a big thing of that. Well, I had my head up my ass on that one because people, some people should not build their own house. <laughs> they, you know, they, I mean, I had, uh, I had two, in one seminar I had these two couples and they looked very much the same. I couldn't even, you know, I got them mixed up. The guy was tall and skinny. They were, you know, they were elderly, 50-ish maybe, or late 40s or something. Uh, my heart bleeds for them. But uh, the guy was tall and thin. The woman was short and heavy. Two couples almost looked identical. One of them, they both got all inspired and bought land around Taos and, and built, started building their airship. And they both, uh, I always advise people, if you're going to do it yourself, start off with just one module. They, this was back in the days when we did use more than these packaged and, and the global designs. So I talked them both into just doing one U first to see how it went. And one couple did a U was successful, did another one, did another one, did another one. I think they even did another one. They got a giant building full of food and everything. The other couple got one you not even done and got a divorce and hated me. You know, so they, these, these people couldn't even operate a shovel, whereas these people could, and they looked just the same. So you never can tell, but what I'm saying is some people should you know some people should do it but when you make a blanket statement like beavers and wasps you know you're just uh, shallow thinking I guess so, so the 205 is, is basically if, if per square foot yeah but I mean that's turnkey to say have you build it all the way out through finish. yeah that's basically what it costs and then, and when we've we've done it all over the world and that is a figure that is you know in the US you know you can you can get a uh, what do you call it, a, the same kind of home that Habitat for Humanity builds for probably $150 a square foot. You know, you can get a junky little frame home for less, but the price of a good, you know, brick veneered, well insulated thermal home that's not really a carbon zero home, but just a good home, is in that ballpark all over the U.S. And like I say, in Santa Fe, there are even a lot more. So you're not saving money on utilities and right, and that's a point. Like, say you take... Uh, Say they cost the same. Say you, you compare it and an Earthship costs 205 a square foot, which maybe equates to, say it costs 300 grand to get the size of a home you want. And, uh, and it costs the same to get a conventional home. And then your mortgage payment on 300 grand, if you're lucky, could be, uh, you know, a couple of grand a month maybe. Uh, uh, and it would be the same here. Then on the conventional home, you'd have to add between 500 and 1,000 a month on utilities uh, to your living expenses, which would make them in the neighborhood of 3,000 a month. Whereas the Earthship, these buildings like the Corner Cottage, uh, the, they, the only thing they use uh, is cooking. And if I were living there, I would be cooking with a solar oven and uh, even I'd rather even use a microwave that runs off of the solar power system than uh, than a propane oven. So, but in the worst scenario, I'm saying, the utility bill on one of these homes in this community that we're doing all over the world is $100 a year. And that's for gas. $100 a year for your utility bill. So that's not bad. That doesn't even, that's not even worth putting in here. Whereas your 500 to 1,000 a month does affect your living expenses. So um, that's the, that's the, the overall living expenses of a carbon zero home can actually be less. Uh, did somebody else have a question on? Uh, well, there, were, <clears throat> there was one question you wanted to have come back, which was the structural integrity oh. of, a, of, a, of a can only or a bottle only. 
Oh, and somebody had a bearing strength yeah. question too. So the, on the can walls, which you will probably be doing some of here in a little bit, uh, cans, bottles, uh, 